Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the afternoon, the first half of the afternoon, the first session. I'm delighted to be your host. I'm Bert Riggs from the President's Steering Committee on World War 100 so Commemorations. And I'm going to introduce to you our two speakers. The first is uh, Terry Bishop Sterling on my immediate left. Terry is a St. John's native, was educated at Memorial University and Queen's University in Kingston. Since 1981, she has taught Newfoundland and Labrador history at Memorial University, and she is currently the head of the history department there, as well as general survey courses on the province. She's developed a course in the history of women in Newfoundland and Labrador, which every time I've ever heard that it's been offered has been oversubscribed. She's a very active public historian who speaks to interested groups on many different aspects of our history. She served on government and volunteer heritage boards, including six years as vice chair of the Provincial Historic Commemoration Board. She's a longtime executive member and a past president of the Newfoundland Historical Society. She's written countless articles and presented numerous papers on Newfoundland social and political history with emphasis on health and welfare policy, women's history and the history of volunteerism. Her work on the First World War includes mobilizing women, uh, Newfoundland for the uh, mobilizing women in Newfoundland for the International Online Encyclopedia of World War I, and such sites one will never forget, Newfoundland Women and Overseas Nursing in the First World War, published by the University of British Columbia Press uh, in an anthology on Canadian and Newfoundland women and World War I. On Terry's immediate left is one of her former students. Heidi Coombs Thorne has a PhD in history from the University of New Brunswick after doing undergraduate and graduate work here at Memorial. She spent her PhD emphasis was on nursing uh, in the Grenfell Mission during the 20th century. She has received numerous grants and awards over the years, including a Faculty of Arts postdoctoral award from Memorial and a scholarship from the Hanna Institute of Medicine. She's presented her research at many regional and national conferences and symposia. She's also a local actor and board member with the Shakespeare by the Sea Festival, and she's on the executive of the Newfoundland Historical Society, where she chairs its program committee. And just to make all that possible, she does have a full-time job as a senior research assistant with Memorial's Faculty of Medicine. So I'm going to call on Terry to go first, and uh, we're going to learn quite a bit, I think, from her this afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, my talk today will look at the fairly immediate newspaper reaction to Beaumont Hamill. As we heard from uh, Margo this morning, by the fall they're looking at other battles, not that Beaumont Hamill disappears from the story, and uh, Dr. Cadogan will talk more about sort of the long-term impact. Um, I'm not doing sort of a political analysis of the various newspapers and the differences between them. And uh, for the period that I'm looking at, uh, really they do take a, much the same approach. Uh, this approach has been looked at uh, in more detail and uh, certainly more vigorously by others uh, than me, including another one of my former students, uh, Robert Harding, and certainly I will be drawing on his 2004 master's thesis Glorious Tragedy, Newfoundland's Cultural Memory of the Battle of Beaumont Hamill, 1916 to 1949. Or if you don't want to read a whole master's thesis, he has an article in Newfoundland Labrador Studies in 2006, which looks at that. Uh, I've looked at, uh, I've spent some time with many of the newspapers from that uh, time period. Uh, the St. John's Dailies, the Daily News, the Daily Star, the Evening Telegram. Uh, I've looked at the Mail and Advocate, uh, the Twillingate Sun, the Western Star, and a little bit of time with the Bay Roberts Guardian. Many of these sources now, uh, as part of Memorial's uh, uh, commemoration of World War I, are being digitized for the war year, or already have been. Uh, as I started to pull this paper together, I I started to think about two, as a big bad historian, I started thinking about two very anachronistic words that came to mind here. 
Um, one of them uh, was uh, closure. Uh, and certainly if you look at the regimental records and letters from families, people needed to know what happened to their sons. They wanted as much detail as possible. And if you look at, at their records, they were particularly a great concern to find uh, where, they, where they died, where they were buried. Uh, so I think the newspapers played uh, a role in trying to provide that. Uh, the other anachronistic uh, word uh, that, uh, that came to mind was spin. Um, how do the newspapers spin this? Uh, how do they portray what was clearly a devastating defeat as, as something glorious and something to be celebrated? as part of a way for the community to deal with this enormous trauma. And it's very easy to kind of dismiss them as, um, you know, them and then the people. And of course they were working with government, they were, uh, only had the information that was being fed to them through official sources in many cases. Um, but they were also proud of that community. At least one of them, Herder of the Evening Telegram, had three sons fighting overseas. He lost a son at Beaumont Hamill and another was injured. Uh, so I think that sort of dichotomy of, of, of them and, and the people uh, we have to be careful with. In this day of social media, news is almost instantaneous. But in 1916, the people of Newfoundland depended on official sources for war news, or waited those longed-for letters, or turned to the newspapers. In addition to the delay and the relay uh, of news and the understandable confusion, in time of great crisis, wartime information was censored on both sides of the Atlantic, sometimes causing further delays and misinformation. The papers seemed to present the news as they received it, but whether because of pressure from government or their own patriotic beliefs or needs, they constructed a view of the tragedy as that of a noble sacrifice. As Harding wrote, what emerged was a common press image of a failed attack where death and destruction were not the most important repercussions. Of greater importance was the nobility of the battalion's effort, which provided it with the military reputation it had lacked for the first two years of the war. As the losses mounted, the press of all political stripes stressed the bravery of the young servicemen who fought like seasoned veterans. These are some of the themes that I'm going to talk about. And their honor in dying for king and country. The accounts, especially in letters and poems, often portrayed the fight as a crusade of right against might. Finally, once it became impossible to keep up the pretense that 1st of July was a great victory, there were still recurring attempts to find meaning in the devastation by linking the campaign to later victories. These may certainly have been sincere beliefs of the newspaper editors, as I said, at least one of whom lost a son at Beaumont Hamill, but it was also politically necessary to help the country deal with the communal trauma and to maintain support and continued war, uh, uh, support for the war effort and, of course, for continued recruitment. So by late June of 1916, while no one knew for sure, there were hints in letters, home, and even signs in the local papers that the Allies were ready to launch a major offensive on the Western Front. The editorial from the Star is really quite extraordinary. It seems to be announcing the attack. All signs of the time seem to indicate that the opportunity is almost ripe for a big offensive movement on the Anglo-French force, of the Anglo-French forces on the Western Front. Talks about the bombardments, and concludes: such activities usually precede attacks in force and are conducted with the intention of wearing down the resisting force and weakening the morale of the enemy. An intention that must surely have been well accomplished by the immense amount of ammunition fired into German lines during the last couple of weeks. Of course, we know it didn't uh, didn't have that. So I did wonder about censorship here. Uh, as I say, this is uh, late June, um, but of course, uh, you know, if if all that bombardment didn't tell the Germans they were coming, I guess a little newspaper on the other side of the Atlantic was not really uh, a major concern. Uh, on July first, the newspapers did report on the big drive, the big offensive, or the great push, the great advance predicted that it would be a real turning point for the war. It spoke of British gains with light casualties. At this point, they're not specifically referencing uh, the Newfoundland Regiment. British headquarters in France, July 1st. A tremendous British offensive was launched at half past seven this morning, 
over a front extending 20 miles north of the Somme. Um, it is too early to give any particulars of the fighting, which is developing in intensity, but it does uh, sort of indicate the British have already occupied the German front lines and have captured many prisoners. The British casualties have so far been comparatively light, according to the official report. The story ends, a British staff officer who witnessed the advance at the junction of the French and British lines said the attack was launched as though the men were on parade. This last line, though about Kitchener's army generally, would reemerge in senior army officers uh, who would be quoted as admiring the Newfoundlanders who followed orders and marched on command like brave professional soldiers. Around the 5th and 6th, the St. John's Papers began to recount the part Newfoundlanders played on July 1st. It was still within the context of a great victory, and the casualties were reported as relatively light. As a matter of fact, the first, so, uh, the first indication I saw of Newfoundlanders killed on the Western Front talked about uh, two men, Bernard Ayer and Victor Daw, who were not with the regiment at all, and then uh, a list of casualties. On July 8th, the Twillingate Sun, Sun reported on a message received from Premier Morris saying that uh, 230 people had been notified to date. And that's an interesting thing too, to, to think about um, in terms of the, uh, how the extent of the tragedy uh, unfolded in the newspapers. Because at least at the beginning, and in other battles when it wasn't such a huge number at once, uh, they tried to notify families first. And if anybody has looked at those telegrams in the regimental record you just saw on them, uh, even before the family, it said, do not deliver until you get in touch with Reverend so-and-so. So often they would try to contact the local clergyman or perhaps a local doctor or somebody else in the community to go and be with the family when they got the telegram. Uh, so that was uh, certainly one thing that also slowed down uh, information. Um, the editorial in the uh, Twillingate Sun was cautiously optimistic, but, unfortunately, but had an unfortunately accurate warning. It says, judging by our own regiment of the small number wounded, with none killed so far, it looks as if the German resistance is very weak. Of course, it is too early to count the chickens. Germany may yet be able to stem the tide, and things may settle back to the old trench warfare, with a few miles as the only gain. Until a German army is actually cut off, and surrenders run into six figures. We may not count a victory, but it ends. It is especially gratifying to this country that our boys, the flower of our, of our country, should be taking an active part in the great drive, whether it be the final drive or only the beginning uh, of a series. And that's the same kind of thing that uh, uh, Shannon saw this morning and said, look, aren't we, aren't we happy that our boys are, some of our boys are at Jutland? Uh, from about July 6 on, the newspapers continued to list more and more dead. On that day, Governor Davidson wrote to the acting uh, Premier J.R. Bennett, uh, and very sorrowfully, uh, quote, passed on the long list of killed, wounded, and missing that he had received that day. He suggested then that given the length of the list, the usual procedure of notifying families individually first should be suspended and the names published by the press as soon as possible to, quote, relieve some, uh, to some extent the public anxiety. Um, so some people may have found out that their sons died by reading it in the newspaper. At first, the losses, as I said, were put in the context of a mighty victory with the Allies, and you could look at many things there. Uh, and again, referring back to some of the more military sessions this morning, uh, of the squeezing of the Germans, that kind of image. Um, the, uh, July 8th, first page of the Daily Star. Um, I, did, I couldn't get a good image of the first page, but you know, if you've ever seen, there was a whole bunch of small little articles. And here are uh, a list of the kinds of headings on those articles. Hard fight brings gains. Uh, triple, def triple defeat forces withdraw enemy withdraw lines. Enemy withdraw lines. More gains by British, etc. So still very, you know, as the numbers are coming in. Still this very positive view. The governor's praise for the regiment was one of the first messages from dignitaries which lauded their performance. Uh, it is the noblest end of all to lay down a life for the highest principles and for the honor of our name, our race, and our empire. And that, of course, is a recurring theme. 
the world will, lit, will ring forever with the imperishable fame of the heroes of Newfoundland who have made sure for all time that the loyal colony is worthy of its ancient name. Other accolades followed. Uh, this is D uh, Davidson, uh, the famous one from, from Hague. Uh, the heroism and devotion to duty they displayed on the 1st of July has never been surpassed. Or General, General Hunter Weston with a, particularly that famous last line. There were no waverers, no stragglers, and not a man looked back. It was a magnificent display of trained and disciplined valor, and its assault only failed because dead men can advance no further. Local commenta commentators repeated these themes. They marveled how quickly the boys had become men and seasoned soldiers who never wavered. Several accounts told of men failing and urging their comrades to go on. They repeated their belief that the, fighting, that the fight for Britain was worth it and, that their faith, and their faith that their deeds would never be forgotten. The Mail and Advocate had an almost full page story on the 8th of August, which was pretty typical. By this time, the full extent of the losses were well known and several survivors have recounted their stories in letters home, some of which had been published. In uh, their, the story, the part played by the Newfoundland Regiment in the Big Dry, July 1st, the Newfoundlanders were given what is now recognized to have been an impossible task, and although they failed, the story of their bravery and daring will live forever. Uh, after recounting the fate of other British troops that had gone over the top, they continue, now came the turn of the Newfoundlanders. The fate which had overcome their comrades daunted them not one bit. Uh, these boys, their average age was under 24, were as steady as veterans, as steady as on the parade in St. John's when they embarked for England to fight for the empire. Not a man hesitated. With a chair, they were over the parapet. Officers fell right and left, but as they fell, they waved their men on. Right to it this time was the cry. Companies melted away, but as each man fell, he always cried. Now right on, boys, right to it this time. This was their slogan. This passage refers to the failed attempt. One of the first times I saw that from local sources. After a while, it became difficult to keep up the talk of glorious advance. Uh, so, but while there were still attempts to see positives and to link the a there were still attempts to see positives and to link the action, which began on 1st of July to later victories. As early as the 10th of July, the Evening Telegram began to recast July 1st as the beginning of a broader, long-term advance, which now challenged German troops at several points. Uh, quote, perhaps the most significant aspect of the Somme Offensive, as it is now known, has been the resumption of the British of the drive forward. This is the thing that I, I would need to look more into, but um, there is sort of almost this feeling of relief that now we're, we're going forward. We're, we're not in defense anymore. We're attacking, and that comes out in several stories. In November, the papers reported that the Allies had finally taken Beaumont Hamel. Some accounts link this and the relief of Verdun directly to the action begun on July 1st. So again, trying to find meaning in the losses. Not surprisingly, all of these stories were accompanied by calls for more men to replace those who had fallen. Keeping up morale and recruitment was an overwhelmingly difficult task in those days. Appealing to honor and duty had always been central to recruiting drives, uh, but now Newfoundland had heroes and men who were called upon to take up their fight so that would, they would not have died in vain. Others were urged to give their money or their time to support the war effort in whatever way they could as a way to honor the fallen. The editorials and news stories recounting the valor of the regiment continued, and I could give you many accounts of this. These stories were augmented by letters from soldiers and their families, and many poems written by family and friends. Many of these letters describe their experience, but those published often included notes of humor, uh, humor or reassurance, such as the following letter uh, from Wim William Mitchell to his mother, written from a hospital in France on July 3rd. My dear mother, I came down to this hospital by ambulance train today because on Saturday, July 1st, I was foolish enough to stop a bullet just below my collarbone, which though painful enough is not, I hope, at all serious, and I hope it will not be long before I shall be shipped back to, uh, back to St. John's. This hospital is a healthy place by the sea on top of a high cliff, so it gives chaps the best chance of making a good recovery. Uh, but no matter how cheerful or positive uh, they tried to be. Many of these letters revealed more of the real horror the men faced. Um, and many of you may have 
seen this letter uh, from Bert Ellis, which was published in the Evening Telegram on the 22nd of July. And it has both the horror and the, the sort of honorable uh, story. The Newfoundland Regiment is about done. They stood to their guns almost to the last man and fought like those who have no fear. When the roll was called, only 43 answered. When I was crawling back, I was all alone and never met a soul all the way back, which was 400 yards, only dead, dead everywhere. The awful sight. It makes me so sick that I used to lie down and wonder if I would go on or stay there. He continued, though. Our boys acted throughout like heroes. They went up on top singing, just as if they were going on a march instead of facing death. Did the way the military, the government, and the press deliver the message about Beaumont Hamill as a noble and worthwhile sacrifice help people to cope and to go on? This is a difficult question to answer. People did continue to work at home, and men continued to enlist, though in declining numbers. Letters from parents in the press and in the soldiers' files do repeat many of the same themes in the newspapers. Their sons had died a good death uh, fighting for a just cause. But there are other stories, such as those revealed in the correspondence of Catherine Anderson, whose son was listed as missing at Beaumont Hamill, and then officially declared dead. Uh, she wrote to the governor and military authorities uh, on the 21st of May, more than 10 months after the battle, and that's one of the things that's striking to me about this letter. It's more than 10 months after the battle. Uh, and she writes, to whom it may concern, I don't know if this is the correct address. I am sending my darling son's photo to you to see if it will be any use to you, as there are na uh, now hopes of being able to trace our missing men. You will see by the photo that he was posted as missing on July 1st, 1916, and later I was sent an, an official notice that he was ki believed killed in action. But there are many of us who believe they are alive. This is ten months later. If you have any proof of my son's death, will you kindly send such to me? Signed, his broken-hearted mother. It is to such sources uh, that we need to turn to see the personal grief. It's hard to capture that from newspaper research or to get any sense of whether the message that the newspapers were putting out was being received. Uh, it does, though, come through in some of the published material, particularly the letters and the poetry, some of which was uh, good, some of which was not so good, um, which was frequently published in the press. I especially like this poem, written by a man in memory of his childhood friend. It juxtaposes the innocent youth with the fallen soldier, and you feel his sorrow and shock that his boyhood friend was so quickly a soldier and then so quickly gone. Uh, the honors and praise gave this man little comfort. And I'd like to close with this, if I have time to read this, uh, this brief. There's a stanza here for you. To the memory of Lieutenant Shortall, who gave his life in defense of empire and home by his friend and classmate, Payson J. Kinsella. May his soul rest in peace. I do not know. I leave it to others to tell the tale of a soldier's death in France and a peon of, mil of martial glory to that glorious line's advance. But twill not wake the eternal slumbers. Dear Dick, dear lad, now sleep. I do not know how best to tell. I know not if to, if to write were well when the heart feels more to weep. I do not know, mine is rather the humble lay, thy deeds of valor let others tell, I but write of the schoolboy day. I remember the dear lad, one happy hour, of the honors and plaudits, well, no, not I, of his glorious end, when the dead they brought from advance. I knew him better as boyhood's friend, dear lad, poor lad in France. I do not know, I do not care what honor glory gave. They tell me the name will live for I, and the fame and honor remains, they say. But for me, I but think of that grave. How rest is today, old schoolmate mine, where they've given thy rest to France. Dear lad, there's peace where thy comrades are, and prayers will go to that land afar, where all died in the last advance. But this I know. Wherever they gave thy body rest, where the tricolor waves perchance, thy memory is dear to one homely heart, till that, last, till that great last hour when none shall part, with no break in the great advance. God's benison upon thy sleep, dear lad, neath the sun-kissed sod of France. Thank you.
Good afternoon. Um, I'd like to start with uh, a little background on how I came to be researching the King George V Siemens Institute during the First World War, because I'm not a military historian. I specialize in gender, nursing, and medical history in Newfoundland and Labrador, particularly with the Grenfell Mission. And it was through my Grenfell research that I came to understand the incredible history of this building and how it was used during the war to accommodate recruits from the outports. So this is very new research and one of those untold stories of the home front from the First World War. But before that, bear with me, I have to give a little bit of background into the Siemens Institute. When the war started in August of 1914, the King George V Siemens Institute was still a new building and a new endeavor of the Grenfell Mission. It was formally opened on the 15th of July 1912, but it didn't open for use until December. This is a photo of the December opening in Grenfell Hall, posted by the governor, Sir Ralph Williams, in the center. Also in attendance were Marmaduke Winter, George Nolan, Clooney McPherson, Gilbert Gosling, and John Harvey, who, along with many others of the elite of St. John's, were very involved with the Grenfell Mission over the years. The building slash endeavor of the Grenfell Mission Seaman Institute was the vision of Sir Wilfred Grenfell. He recognized the need for wholesome temporary accommodations for outport fishermen, sealers, and naval reservists while they were in St. John's. The mission estimated that in 1912, approximately 80,000 fishermen and seamen entered the port annually, and that, quote, there was not a place in St. John's where one of these men can spend an hour of innocent recreation or sit down with a friend and be decent. The harbor was encircled by 57 saloons where warmth and companionship was extended to all strangers. <laughs> In keeping with the widespread social reform and temperance sentiments of the day, the Institute was planned to help mitigate against the perils of the harbor where men's lives were ruined by the temptations of alcohol. As such, along with offering safe and affordable accommodations, the Institute provided alcohol-free entertainments Educational, the, uh, educational lectures, concerts, and moving pictures by Mr. Kiley of the Nickel Theatre. This is a photo from one of the Institute's events, and you may have seen this before. It's from the 7th of March, 1913. In terms of amenities, the Institute had a restaurant, a temperance bar, a bowling alley, a gymnasium, and a swimming pool, which served the dual purpose of encouraging bathing and also offering swimming lessons to the many fishermen who spent their lives on the sea but couldn't swim. It had a games room with billiard tables, an officer's room with chess boards and a globe, and a lend-a-hand reading room for which Andrew Carnegie donated $500 to create the library. The Institute also had a girls department on the top floor to provide safe accommodations for women from the outports while they were in St. John's. So in general, Grenfell intended the Institute to be a place of uplift, a radiating center of helpfulness, an object lesson in cleanliness, and a power for righteousness. The building was designed free of charge by renowned New York architects, William Adel Adams Delano and Chester Holmes Aldridge. And Delano was actually a board member of the Grenfell Association of America, and he was the cousin of um, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Delano and Aldrich engage, um, designed townhouses, country homes, and clubs for the elite clients of New York, such as the Rockefellers and the Astors. They also designed banks and other public buildings, and several buildings on the campus of Yale University. Many of their buildings have become landmarks and historic sites in the United States. The King George V Siemens Institute was a characteristic Delano and Aldrich building. Neoclassical style constructed with their trademark feature, brick with limestone trim. From the very beginning, the Institute was high profile for the Grenfell mission. Grenfell had recently been successfully tapping into a significant network of wealthy American philanthropists who were eager to support his cause, hence his connection to Delano and Aldrich. As a result, the vast majority of funds raised for the Institute came from the United States, although significant contributions also came from Canada, Britain, and Newfoundland. In St. John's, Sir Edgar Bowring don donated the site on which the Institute was built, valued at $13,000. 
The building was highly promoted on both sides of the Atlantic. In fact, the mission arranged for King George V himself to lay the cornerstone for the building on the same day as his coronation. On June 22, 1911, at a predetermined time, the King pushed a button at Buckingham Palace that sent a telegraph signal to the site on Water Street and triggered a switch to lower the cornerstone into place. However, even before the building had opened its doors, it became the center of international controversy. In August of 1912, the Institute's superintendent was convicted of misappropriation of funds. The incident sparked a public relations crisis as newspapers across North America reported graft and embezzlement with the Grenfell Mission. Business practices of the entire Grenfell Mission were called into question, and the incident created a lot of anger and disagreement among Grenfell supporters here in St. John's. In addition, there also developed friction between Newfoundlanders who wanted to use the building and the Institute's authorities in London. For example, in February 1913, William Coker was refused use of the Institute for meetings of the Fishermen's Protective Union because the London office did not want meetings at the Institute of a political nature. Coker was furious, especially since Grenfell had told him that the FPU could use the building whenever they wanted. Um, and it seemed counterintuitive that a building built for fishermen and seamen would be refused to fishermen and seamen. So at this period of time, there were very strained relations at the Institute as it struggled to find its place in the community. And it made for some negative public relations in its early years of operation. However, two national emergencies would occur in 1914 that would give the Siemens Institute the opportunity to prove its value to St. John's and to Newfoundland and Labrador. The second emergency was the First World War, but before that there was the sealing disaster. The SS Bellaventure steamed into St. John's on the 4th of April 1914, carrying the victims and survivors of the sealing disaster. The Colonial Secretary, J.R. Bennett, asked the Institute Committee if they would place the building at the disposal of the government for the reception of bodies. And they did so. And Clooney, Dr. Clooney McPherson, who was then superintendent of the St. John Ambulance Association and also a board member of the Institute Committee, offered the services of the St. John Ambulance for the emergency. McPherson helped arrange for survivors who were able to walk to be brought to the Institute to be treated there, while more serious cases were brought to the General Hospital. There were approximately 15 survivors housed in the Institute. Members of the brigade, along with naval reservists from HMS Calypso, carried the men to the Institute and brought them up the elevator to the top floor. This is a photo of reservists from the Calypso helping to carry a survivor on a stretcher. And if you'll notice, it might be a bit small, but the newspaper clipping to the left um, shows that just four weeks earlier, men from the Calypso had given a couple of concert parties for the sealers at the Institute before they went away to the ice. Now, here they were carrying frost-burnt victims of the sealing disaster back to the Institute. The experience of being exposed on the ice in a blizzard and seeing so many of their companions die was of course traumatizing for the survivors and McPherson described them as stunned by the calamity. But on top of that experience, the 15 survivors were relied upon to help identify the frozen bodies of their dead sealers who were kept in a temporary morgue in the basement of the Institute. McPherson's testimony at the sealing inquiry illustrates the difficult scene in the morgue Quote, I was in and out of the mortuary room a good deal because I had a detachment on duty there all the time that they were there practically, at least all the time that relatives were there because of the number of cases of hysteria and one thing and another. So I had a detachment there all the time. Adding to the grief of finding a loved one dead at the Institute was the distorted state of some of the bodies. If a man died lying forward on the ice, his face would be distorted and often swollen and discolored from being frost burnt. Reflecting on what he witnessed in the morgue at the Siemens Institute, McPherson stated, quote, the men who go out to the ice are all pretty fair physique. They were all a splendid body of men. It was a terrible thing to see such hard looking healthy men in a heap dead. This national tragedy that landed at the Siemens Institute juxtaposed the many celebrations, events, concerts, and parties that had been taking place at the Institute during its first year of operation. 
And despite all the controversy surrounding the Institute since its construction, at a time of tremendous need within the community, the Institute and the Grenfell Mission stepped in and provided the necessary assistance. Four months later, Newfoundland and Labrador would face another national emergency, and again the Siemens Institute would play an important role. When the war broke out in August of 1914, volunteers began to stream into St. John's from other parts of Newfoundland and Labrador. My research is on a very small aspect of mobilization, the accommodations of volunteers and a military culture that developed beyond the barracks in St. John's. And that was the role played by the Siemens Institute. I have found references to outport men staying at the Institute in August and September 1914 while waiting to join camp at Pleasantville, but I haven't found any documents outlining the arrangements made between the Newfoundland Patriotic Association and the Grenfell Mission about these accommodations. But according to Grenfell, from the very beginning, the Institute was used by volunteers from the outports. As he stated, quote, owing to the large crowd of young men, now all the time passing through the city to and from the war, it became advisable to make a headquarters at the Institute for their idle hours. And by arrangement with the government, some 75 slept and boarded there. These are some more photos of the interior of the Institute, a bedroom and a bathroom. And I suspect this would have been quite a bit more comfortable than staying in barracks. And the Institute accommodations were also superior to those found in private boarding houses throughout the city. When they arrived in St. John's, the volunteers were met at trains and steamers by orderlies who would then send them to billets and boarding houses throughout the city. The men were provided with an allowance for accommodations while out of barracks, and sometimes they could be out of barracks for weeks, especially if there were delays setting up camp due to weather. In St. John's in December 1914, for example, men were entirely boarded at the Institute for several weeks, and on Christmas Eve, quote, a smoking concert was given to the men of the Newfoundland Regiment and the Royal Naval Reserve. Christmas cheer was provided by the ladies of the city, tobacco, cigars, and cigarettes by several gentlemen, and a delightful program was arranged. The hall and restaurant were beautifully decorated. His Excellency the Governor, the Premier, and many leading citizens called in during the evening. Indeed, throughout 1914, the Institute received in an increase in use for living purposes, but a decrease in use of amenities like the swimming pool, the billiard tables, and the bowling alley. It also recorded a decrease in use of its regular patrons, the outport fishermen. Fishermen, for some reason, became hesitant to stay at the Institute as it was increasingly full of rowdy soldiers, either arriving from the outports, doing their training, or returning from war. This, along with the fact that the rooms and amenities were charged to the regiment at a significant discount, contributed to an operating deficit of $825 for 1914. This deficit would only increase by 1916 to approximately $2,500. And Grenfell is recorded to have stated that for patriotic reasons, the organization has suffered terribly. So financially, offering the building for the war put a strain on the Institute, and it put the Institute Committee into a difficult position. Whereas in the past, if they had financial problems for construction costs or an operating deficit, they could go to the Grenfell Association of America in New York for assistance. But they didn't feel they could ask Americans to help them out in this case, where they turned the Institute into a type of barracks for a war which the Americans were not a part of. So the committee turned to the government and asked for $1,200 towards their deficit. In his memorandum on the state of the Institute in 1916, the superintendent, Walter Jones, stated, quote, the introduction of so many men into the Institute under little, if any, discipline has affected our takings in a large measure. The absence of that order and quietude which contributes to the comfort of our guests has led to a considerable falling off of our ordinary business. Housing soldiers at the Institute also meant increased miscellaneous costs. For example, the billiard tables became damaged by the volunteers because most of the men were novices at the game, and sometimes reckless such that the tables had to be recovered six months before the usual time. Recognizing the direct impact the war was having on the regular operations of the Institute, the government provided them with $1,500 to help cover costs. In the meantime, the Institute continued to become a headquarters for soldiers' idle hours. On the 19th of June, 1916, 100 years ago tomorrow, the Women's Patriotic Association officially opened the Soldiers and Sailors Club at the Institute. 
The club was located in Grenfell Hall and the gymnasium, and it was intended as a place open to all members of the regiment or Naval Reserve, regardless of whether or not they were staying at the Institute. It provided games, local and foreign newspapers and magazines, a writing room with desks, pens, ink and paper, as well as refreshments and entertainments, particularly by the Church Lads Brigade and the Catholic Cadet Corps. I searched through the records of the WPA and only found a few references to the fact that this club existed, and the Grenfell records state that there was some indifference to this club. So it may be that perhaps um, their offerings were already available to men who were staying in the Institute. However, I found one member of the regiment who stayed at the Institute in 1916 and used the club stationery to write letters home to his family. <clears throat> this is Private Arthur Maidment from Trinity. He enlisted with the regiment in June of 1916, and while he was in training, he had a half holiday on the evening of June 28th and decided to go to the Siemens Institute. So at the time that he was writing this letter, the regiment in France was getting ready for Beaumont Hamel. You can see here that he wrote on stationery provided by the Soldiers and Seamen's Club. Maidment left St. John's in September for training in Scotland, and by December he was in France. He also would have been writing at a time when the newspapers were full of this optimism um, and a positive outlook for the, the British Army in the war. However, he was killed at the Second Battle of the Scarp in April 1917. And I'd like to thank Jim Miller and the Trinity Historical Association for, and John Cheeseman for telling me about um, Arthur Maidman. Sometimes random conversations lead to, um, can be very productive. So I'm hoping to find out more about recruits who stayed at the Institute during the war from a soldier's perspective, what it was like to stay there. And if anyone has leads, please let me know. I do know that Frances Cluett um, stayed there during her training as a VAD, although her stay was delayed because the building was full of um, the crew of the Porsche because there was a stoker strike at the time. So she stayed at the, the Browning's house, I believe, for a couple of days and then went to the Institute. As the war came to an end in the fall of 1918, the Siemens Institute was also involved in accommodating the flood of soldiers returning from Europe. But before that, if I have time, there was one more national emergency which the Institute um, stepped forward and provided a value to the city, and that was the influenza epidemic. On the 14th of October, the Colonial Secretary wrote to Walter Jones at the Siemens Institute that the government was taking over the Institute to accommodate patients who had contracted um, influenza. By mid-October, the existing hospitals in the city were already at full capacity. The Siemens Institute was the most logical uh, building for conversion into a temporary hospital. Jones immediately handed over the building um, to the medical authorities and he stayed on as manager during um, its use as a temporary hospital. Within six hours he had one ward ready complete with necessary furniture and equipment and 12 patients had been admitted. Through the course of nine weeks from October 14th to December 7th approximately 267 patients were admitted to the Institute including 47 men from the city 100 women and children, including 41 from the outports who were working in St. John's as domestic servants, and 120 fishermen and seamen from outport Newfoundland and other countries, including England, Scotland, the United States, Spain, Portugal, Denmark, Russia, Somalia, and the West Indies. So it was a very international mix of people. 31 people died of influenza at the Institute during that period, including Ethel Dickinson, who had served with the Volunteer Aid Detachment during the war, and she was assisting at the Institute as a nurse um, when she contracted the virus herself and died two, year, two days later. Upon making his final report to the Department of Public Health, Jones expressed his appreciation to the government for placing their confidence in him during the emergency, and he concluded Quote, it has been a sad pleasure, the hardest time of my life, and although I am tired and run down, it is in the work and not of it. For his efforts, the government provided Jones with a $900 honorarium and reimbursed the Institute for the loss of income during the period. By December 9th, the worst cases of the epidemic had passed, and any new cases were sent to the fever hospital so that the Institute could be fumigated and prepared to receive soldiers returning from overseas. But for the third time since the spring of 1914, the Grenfell Mission and the Siemens Institute put its own agenda on hold to provide assistance during the national emergency. 
So just by way of a quick conclusion, when the Institute was constructed in 1912, it had a very specific purpose, to provide decent accommodations for outport fishermen and seamen who passed through St. John's throughout the year. By so doing, the Grand Commission also hoped to improve the lives of these people by providing literary materials, educational lectures, and non-alcoholic events to keep the men out of the saloons. This was an era of social reform and temperance when the middle classes invested significant time and energy into improving the plight of working people. The Institute had its own difficulties in its early years of operation and a struggle to find its place in the community in St. John's. And indeed, this was a period of transition for the entire Grenfell Mission as the Labrador branch pulled away from its parent organization in London and created the International Grenfell Association in 1914. However, during the sealing disaster of 1914, the events of First World War and the crisis of the influenza epidemic, the Institute prioritized the needs of the people and the government and thereby proved its worth to the community at large. The Institute was constantly trying to balance wartime requirements with the needs of the fishing and seafaring community, which was its primary purpose. But I hope that I've given you an idea of um, some of the accommodations for soldiers outside of barracks while they were in St. John's. Thank you. We have some time for questions or comments, if anyone wishes to uh, advance the discussion. Margot. When I've read the WPA records um, for World War I, I've come across a reference to the Caribou Hut, which was entertaining soldiers and sailors. Um, there's a much more famous caribou hut in World War II. Mm -hmm. I'm now beginning to question my own interpretation. I've always imagined that it was down at Pleasantville in some sort of temporary headquarters or quarters. Now I'm wondering whether it was in fact at the Institute. Do you know what the relationship is, was is this, between is the this two? Turn on? This is good. Um, I'm not sure if they were separate or um, if they were called two different things because I know the Institute became the Caribou Club during the Second World War. Um, so I couldn't find very much about the Soldiers and Seamen's Club. Um, there may have been something separate in Pleasantville which would also explain why the Soldiers and Sailors Club was not used. There wasn't a lot of um, pickup with it. So there might have been something separate in, that would be interesting to find out. Only a, a brief comment. I know of at least two naval reservists who died in the Newfoundland sealing disaster. So it was e even more poignant for the people wow. who were um, helping because yeah. they saw their mates come in dead. And uh, yeah. there's at least two, and, and I haven't done a thorough, you know. In the sealing disaster? Yeah. yeah. Wow. As the host, what? Can I ask a question? Yes, of course you can. <laughs> yes. Uh, Terry, in the last letter you were reading out, mm -hmm. I very much enjoyed both your presentations, by the way. That was very fresh. It was nice. In the last letter you were reading out, um, the writer mentioned a tricolor flag. Was that the French flag, or was that the pink, white, and green Newfoundland flag, do you think? Oh, no, no, I think, I think it was the French flag, because it's wherever you are. However, <laughs> um, I stumbled upon something. I did a lot of digging, and it was very frustrating to not find very much about the Siemens Institute, but I stumbled upon um, some discussion about the medals for uh, Gallipoli, and there was some conversation about possibly having pink, white, and green for the ribbon, um, but they decided they wouldn't do that because I believe the um, the Orangemen's Association would disapprove. But there is something in the archives, buried in the archives, about that. Ian, I'm going to turn it over to Ian because he knows the answer. There was no medal for Gallipoli. So the. Um there was a discussion about a medal for Gallipoli. The Australians and New Zealanders, in fact, designed one. The Newfoundlanders jumped on board. 
and national or internationally in the Allies, they said no, the 1914-15 the star would be for that as opposed to a separate one. But there was discussion, and in fact discussion at local levels. Um, if you actually, it is diverse in the archives. It's mentioned three or four times in totally random places. You come by it randomly, and I have them somewhere. Um, but, but they discussed different, they discussed the red, right, uh, the, um, the, tri the Newfoundland, pink, white, and green. Um, they talked about whether that wouldn't be acceptable. It was almost at a governor's and a governor's assistant level. Yeah. And the one that they, they decided they would come down with was a, a maroon and white. And so the maroon and white was right. what they decided would be the uh, ribbon for it. And then the whole project and got kiboshed. Was that the regimental colors? It was the divisional yeah. colors for the, for the 29th Division. Um, interestingly, in the 1990s, I think it was, a private Australian citizen um, uh, manufactured the Gallipoli Star, which was what it was going to be, privately, and then gave, I believe it was, to the 200 or so remaining Gallipoli veterans. He gave them each a star, and then the rest were sold on eBay. I have a replica at home with a a uh, colored in white and maroon ribbon. Mm -hmm. uh, before we break, just to tie your end with last night's film, uh, most people don't realize that Ethel Dickinson was the first cousin of Eric Ayer and Bernard Ayer and Ruby Ayer and mm -hmm. Walter Ayer and Robert Charles Ayer because their mothers were all sisters. They were all Pitts uh, uh, brothers, their brother was Pitts of Pitts Memorial Hall, and uh, they were three sisters, two of whom married heirs, and the third married uh, a Dickinson. Mm -hmm. So we'll, I think, have a short break, and then we'll come back for the final session of the afternoon. Thank you.